Technology has a tendency to, you know, move forward. Even if the entire world doesn't reach the same point at the same time, as a whole, humanity's technological improvements have continued to improve and build upon one another. When the Sumerians invented the wheel in roughly 4000 BC, society didn't then forget about it for a thousand years, only to need to invent it all over again. That would be disappointing. Even if that had happened, people would likely have been able to reverse engineer the wheel from the stories they heard. If epic tales were being told of people carrying heavy carts with ease thanks to round stone wheels, it wouldn't exactly take long for somebody to carve a stone into something resembling a wheel and well off you go. But every once in a while we encounter something that can't easily be replicated. There may exist reliable documentation that a technology existed, but even after 2,000 years of technological advancement we've been unable to figure out exactly what some things were or how they were created. One of the most well-known lost technologies is Greek fire. It was also one of the most feared, as the term Greek fire became synonymous with any incendiary weapon. Such weapons were commonplace, and primitive grenades date all the way back to the 3rd century AD. These grenades uh, would use chemicals that would ignite when exposed to enough heat or sunlight, but they were a far cry from actual Greek fire. First developed in roughly 672 AD by the Eastern Roman Empire rather than the Greeks, Greek fire was much more like napalm. It was given the name Greek fire by European crusaders, but its creators simply named it liquid fire. It was heavily used in naval battles because it could easily spread and continue to burn even when on top of the water. Not only did the Byzantines use the compound to thwart crusaders at sea, but they also built pressurized nozzles that could spray the self-igniting liquid onto their enemies. For all intents and purposes, they had invented flamethrowers. This liquid was extremely dangerous and it would stick to anything it touched, be it a ship's hull or a person's skin. Once the liquid chemical was on something, it was nearly impossible to put out. It clearly couldn't be put out with water since it burned on top of the sea, and some sources even indicate that it was actually ignited by the water itself. The only substances that were known to be able to extinguish the flames were sand, strong vinegar, and uh, old urine. <laughs> the composition of Greek fire was a closely guarded state secret at the time, and one that nobody was able to replicate. Arabs managed to capture an entire Byzantine flagship full of Greek fire in 827, but they could not reproduce the compound. They were able to create a mostly similar incendiary weapon, but it just wasn't the same. Despite having captured some of the siphons, the flamethrower-like devices used to deploy the weapon, they were unable to reproduce the deployment system. Instead, the Arabs used catapults and grenades as the delivery system for their version of Greek fire. It's unclear exactly when the formula for Greek fire was lost. There are some accounts of it being used through the 11th through 13th centuries, but it is strongly believed that all or most of these were just other incendiary weapons. To date, we haven't been able to figure out exactly what Greek fire was. Early theories suggested that the primary ingredient was either saltpeter or quicklime, but these have since been refuted. The most promising current theory is that the primary ingredient used was what the Persians called naphtha, better known to us today as crude oil. Given that the description of Greek fire is very similar to that of napalm, this does make a lot of sense. Napalm is just gasoline combined with naphthalene and palmitate to turn it into a sticky substance. It is believed that a similar effect may have been achieved using resins as a thickening agent, but the exact formula continues to elude us. Glass naturally occurs in nature, but humans have been making our own glass for about 4,000 years. Glass making was a major trade, and when glass blowing was invented around the 1st century BC, it led to a lot of advancements with glass. One of the chief endeavors of glass makers was to try and create higher quality glass than their competitors. The year was around 20 AD, and a humble glass maker was fortunate enough to gain an audience with Emperor Tiberius Caesar. He'd been hard at work trying to develop the finest glass, and he had finally created his masterpiece, vitrium flexile, or flexible glass. He brought a drinking bowl to Tiberius, who inspected it, and then he handed it back to the man unimpressed. Glassmaker then threw the bowl at the grounds with all of his might, and it didn't shatter. The bowl suffered little more than a dent. The glassmaker picked it up off the ground, pulled out a small hammer, and then banged the glass back into its original shape. He was sure that this display of his craftsmanship would win him the emperor's favor, but he couldn't have been more wrong. Tiberius asked the man if he'd shared the formula with anyone else. When the man answered no, 
he was promptly beheaded. The flexible glass would have been far too important of an invention, and Tiberius feared that its discovery would lead to the devaluation of gold, silver, and other precious metals. At the very least, that's how the story is told by Petronius, a known satirist. Pliny the Elder's telling of the tale is far more subdued, and it ends with the Emperor Millie shutting down the glassmaker's workshop to prevent him from making more rather than actually chopping his head off. Both historians were alive at the time this tale allegedly took place, though Pliny made sure to add that the story was more widely spread than well authenticated. And this just leaves us with one simple question. Did this even really happen? Was flexible glass a real invention of Roman times? We unfortunately can't say with any certainty that it really happens, but we can say that it was possible with the technology available at the time. The secret ingredient could have been borax, a compound that was known to the Romans and would have been available at the time. If borax was added to glass and heated to extremely high temperatures, it would have created something similar to modern-day borous silicate glass. This glass is much stronger than traditional glass and is often referred to as being unbreakable or shatterproof. While it's definitely not unbreakable if you're actively trying to break it, it can survive a simple drop on the floor. So we know that it is possible for flexible glass to have been invented in ancient Roman times, but if it had, no pieces of this glassware have survived the millennia. Without access to a time machine, there may never be a way for us to know if flexible glass was indeed a form of borosilicate, if it was created using a different process, or if it was just an urban legend that stumbled its way into some history books. <laughs> Originating in the 9th century, Damascus steel was a type of steel used to create some of the most incredible swords ever forged. While the most common explanation for the name is that they were named after Damascus, the capital city of Syria, where these swords were bought and sold, that's actually a matter of debate. It's possible the name came from the swordsmith Damaski, who is mentioned by the Islamic historian Al-Biruni. It may also come from the Arabic word damas, meaning watered, as a description of the distinct patterns that the steel blades possessed. Damascus steel was said to be incredibly durable and strong, able to cut through rocks or to slice in half a single hair that fell on its blade. There are a few surviving Damascus steel blades, most of which are showcased in museums, and testing on the extinct swords has shown that the claims are more than a bit exaggerated. Still, the blades were definitely extremely strong, especially for the time period. The key to the strength of Damascus steel was to accidentally perform science that was over a thousand years ahead of its time. The steel used for these blades was woot steel. Woot steel was manufactured in South India, and ingots were shipped to Syria, where there was a thriving weapons industry. Multiple ores were used in the smelting process, and woody biomass, particularly bamboo, was added to enrich the steel with carbon. The result was a form of steel that was both super plastic and extremely hard, thanks to the exceptionally high carbon content. But the metallurgists at the time didn't have any idea why they were getting the results they were getting. They clearly learned through trial and error that it was the most effective means of smelting their steel, but there was no no way for them to know just how important using plant biomass was in their process. That wouldn't be discovered until 2006, thanks to a research team out of Germany. According to their paper that was published in Nature, one of the top scientific journals, the researchers discovered cementite nanowires and carbon nanotubes in the blades forged with Damascus steel. That sounds incredible, if not impossible, but later research showed that carbon nanotubes can be derived from plant fibers. Obviously, at the time, nobody knew that these swords were making use of carbon nanotubes, but by using plants as a carburizing additive, the swords they created were unknowingly truly ahead of their time. Now you might be thinking, well, that's all fascinating fact, boy, but clearly we understand what these swords are made of and we can make more. And logically, it sounds like we should be able to reproduce the blades, especially since we understand what's happening better than the people who actually made them. But surprisingly, we can't. Many attempts have been made in modern times to replicate Damascus steel, but none have been completely successful. It has been speculated that the problems lie in differences with either the manufacturing process or the raw materials. That's hardly a bold claim, since those are the only two components, but it's a little more complicated than that. It's believed that differences in the quality of the ores being used may prevent the creation of authentic Damascus steel, with there being some evidence that its production ended because India simply ran out of the ore that was being used. As for the manufacturing process, while we know a lot about the process itself, we don't have every single detail. And that's a big deal, because everything would need to be recreated almost perfectly. While the creation of carbon nanotubes in their steel would not have been known to the smelters, the quality of the steel was still the result of a highly refined process. 
even small changes to the quality of ores being used, the exact proportions of different ores, the amount of biomass used, the temperatures to which the crucibles were heated, or other minor variation, might be enough to prevent the formation of carbon nanotubes in the steel. Without having access to the same raw materials, or knowing exactly what techniques were used, we may never be able to recreate authentic Damascus steel. Of course, we could always just settle for cheap knockoffs. Damascus steel has become a bit of a catch-all term for any knife that features a similar banding pattern on the blade to those that appear on the famous swords. They may not be as good as the originals, but they still look pretty cool, and it's almost certainly going to be good enough for anything that you'll actually need it for. Panjagan was a weapon developed by the late Sasanian Empire. At least, it probably was. It might have just been an archery technique, and there is some debate over which it was, but the prevailing opinion is that it was more likely a weapon rather than a technique. Whatever it was, the Panjagan was instrumental in the Sasanians' victory over the Gok Turks and their famous cavalry during the three Persio Turkic Wars. The name Panjagan comes from the Middle East Persian word for fivefold, and it was described as a device that could fire five arrows at once. It is unlikely this was simply a technique for firing arrows, rather than an actual weapon, as firing five arrows at the same time from a traditional bow would be absolutely useless. Thanks to basic physics, each arrow would only have one-fifth of the power of a single arrow, resulting in them flying weakly for a very short distance. They'd also be impossible to aim in any sort of meaningful way. No examples of the Panjagan have survived to the present day, and the Sasanians didn't leave us behind any blueprints for these devices, at least none that we found so far. The descriptions of the weapon and its devastating effects come almost exclusively from Islam authors who wrote about the Panjagan after conquering the Sasanian Empire. There are some artist depictions of the battles in which they were used as well. It seems most likely that the Panjagan was some sort of repeating crossbow. The Chinese had repeating crossbows as far back as 200 AD, a solid 400 years before the Sasanians and their weapon, but their performance was nothing compared to the historians' descriptions of the Panjagan. Even if it was a repeating crossbow, as is strongly believed, the most consistent detail of the weapon is its ability to simultaneously fire five arrows. This created a kill zone that was difficult even for adept cavalrymen to avoid. In one description from the Second Islamic Civil War, a group of Sasanian archers were described as firing 2,000 arrows in one burst, forcing the opposing spearmen to retreat. While we have some solid ideas based on the evidence, without a single surviving Panjagan, we'll never know for sure how they worked, and there's honestly a little reason to attempt to recreate them. From an historical standpoint, even if someone built a repeating cross both that could launch five arrows simultaneously using only period appropriate materials we'd have no way to know whether or not it was an accurate recreation and from a utility standpoint we don't need panjagans anymore because you know we have guns